Hi, let me tell you a story, a true story. Two months ago, we had three days of very heavy rains and thunderstorms here, which led to trees falling on electric transmission lines and there was widespread disruption of power supply. The mobile communication towers also stopped working and being a low priority rural area, there were no diesel generators to keep them running. I live in Savantwadi, a small town in the Konkan region of the Western Ghats. For a day and a half, there was no power here. But in my village, which is some 20 kilometers away, there was no electricity for more than three days. No electricity and no mobile network for three full days. And after three days, when the network resumed, my SIM card somehow stopped working and it took a while to be replaced. The result of all this was that I was without a data network for more than 12 days. I was in my farm, busy the whole day with regular monsoon activity. But before 8.30 a.m. and after 6.30 p.m., I was glancing now and then at the mobile screen, drawn to it by some invisible force. Soon, this became very troubling. Monsoon is beautiful in Savantwadi. At the peak of monsoon, the temperature remains between 24 and 27 degrees centigrade all through the day and falls to between 18 and 20 degrees at night. Being amidst a forest, one can feel the pulse of nature throbbing with life and abundance. Yet, seated in the evenings in these beautiful surroundings, sipping a cup of hot tea after a fulfilling day, I caught myself glancing time and again at my mobile screen. Sometimes, even picking up the phone unconsciously and then putting it back because there was no network. Why did I do that? There was nothing particular I was looking for. To hold the phone, to be held captive by it, to be lost inside its content, that had become a habit. A habit which had grown to such a deep level and so slowly and surreptitiously. YouTube and WhatsApp and the news apps, they had got my mind dependent. It had turned the mind compulsive in a way that when I was aware of it, I myself was repulsed. Is it because I am mostly alone in the evenings that I reach for the phone? Would I behave differently if I was with people all the time? I considered this. Yes, being with visitors certainly takes the mind to a high level of alertness and freshness. So if I had people here in the farm all the time, would that make a difference? Or will this farm also become like many of my friends' and relatives' homes where each of them is pulled into his or her phone or iPad and live in solitary mode? Where the only time they sit together on a sofa is not facing one another, but together facing the television. Anyway, what exactly do I do on the mobile? I asked myself. I could try and justify that I only see useful videos on YouTube that I see the links sent to me on WhatsApp by friends and family who are very dear to me, or that I am keeping myself abreast of developments through news apps. The truth, of course, is more than that. To give one example, I was sucked into a chess channel and was watching chess games analysis every day. I even began to watch live chess matches. Imagine a live chess match where nothing moves for five minutes. Then there are the health videos in this time of Corona, the critiques of media hype and modern medicine, the alternative cures, the yoga and Ayurveda channels and the new diets. I also followed, without quite knowing why, a Sanskrit channel about Indian scriptures and in my days even made a donation to him. I followed magic shows and also spent hours watching a guy revealing how magic tricks are done. I don't even have a pack of cards at home for the last 20 years. I also followed two mathematics channels, dazzled by presentations on things I cannot even recall now, except that it included one quite meaningless proof that 1 is equal to 2. And then there are the spiritual channels. There is Krishnamurti, Osho is an old magnet, and now there is Sadhguru. There are also the organic farming channels, the environment and ecology channels, the political channels, the critiques of modernity, the Bharatiya and Indic channels. So much YouTubing.
and all these were holding and pulling me towards them as if I had little control of myself. One may feel there is nothing wrong on the surface with all this, but some introspection would reveal that there are indeed problems worthy of attention. The first is that this type of exposure fragments the mind. Some would say YouTube is in fact designed to do that, to keep the mind on constant shopping mode. The mind flits about here and there, sniffing at this and that. It is the complete opposite of meditation. Soon this becomes a habit and the habit diminishes the alertness of the mind. The dull blank look in the eyes of people who look up from their mobiles is a sign of this, as is the anguished and imploring look in the eyes of those whose network has deserted them. A second cause of concern is that this type of browsing keeps the mind tied down in the realm of familiarity without adding any depth of clarity to it. It's a trick our school education system has played with us before and the YouTube exposure only strengthens that weakness. For example, I am familiar with the words Tantra, Mantra, Yantra, Sukta, Stotra, etc. and therefore followed them on the Sanskrit channel. I ask myself now, what more do I know about them after this exposure? What are my insights? If asked, can I explain these concepts to you? The answer is no. I have remained at the level of the familiar, wading in a shallow lake of verbal familiarity without my mind adding any depth to itself. Similarly with other things like calculus, quantum mechanics, dark energy, black hole, words which attract me to the math and science channels, or atma, consciousness, samadhi, enlightenment, bliss, etc., words which attract me to the spiritual channels. What really have I learned? A third concern is the division happening within human minds. The peculiar programming of social media links means that people are pushed and prodded into echo chambers. They only listen to their own opinions reflecting back. This is seen in the links offered to us on YouTube. This is also particularly true of WhatsApp groups. Much of WhatsApp group content, maybe not the family groups, it pushes people further in the direction of their own stated opinions, their shared obsessions or even shared hatred. One questions if any meaningful mental development can happen in such echo chambers. A fourth concern is that much of the content we absorb is intellectual. It's a play on our thought, faith, beliefs, opinions and biases. I wish this enormous exposure to internet content had more to show in terms of how it changes our daily life, our competence, our relationships, the way we live in this world. But from what we can see, that is not happening. Whether it is subscribing to leftist revolutionary channels or Gandhi channels or Hindutva channels or Krishnamurti channels or alternative living channels, so much of it remains at the level of armchair intellectualism, a vicarious pleasure using internet time which cannot or does not translate into our lives in the real world. One has been on the exploratory path for a long time with a lot of reading, research, questioning and contemplation. Every now and then I like to pause and ask myself what transformation has occurred in me, in my living, in my relationships, in what way am I a better human being, a better social citizen? And now with a year of YouTubing, I would like to pause again and ask those same questions. But to see, to observe and learn from that, I have to detach myself from the mobile and give myself to myself. A year ago, when I first forwarded a YouTube link to my son, he laughingly remarked, welcome to the rabbit hole. Now I see the full meaning of what he said. Even a rabbit hole has to end somewhere, but YouTube is a bottomless pit. And with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc., of which I have little personal experience, I am told that they could have additional problems of inducing exhibitionism, validation seeking and approval anxiety. I recall the great philosopher J. Krishnamurti who in a talk about freedom and the conditioned mind once said something to the effect, why do you read other people's books? 
Look at your own life. Your life is a book. Read it. Maybe one can apply a similar observation to chasing YouTube videos that those who are doing and presenting the stuff, whether it is analyzing and offering opinions or producing entertainment videos, they are facing the reality of their world in whatever limited way. Isn't that so? And their YouTube products are a result of their experience or excitement or in some cases livelihood. They are the producers. And we, the consumers, are the addicts who are let down the rabbit hole. We detach ourselves from our reality and are, to compare with Krishnamurti's comment, only viewing other people's lives, while our own life is there to observe and through it to see ourselves, our home, our neighbors, our community, and indeed the whole world. While musing about all this, my new SIM card arrived and the data network was also restored. But the question had been raised and one has to find a resolution to this. I delayed reinstalling WhatsApp by a month and I still hesitate to participate in my old groups. The YouTube app is there. We are still friends, but our relationship has undergone a change. I use it for information and research, of course. But some new cells in me and my brain remain alert and warn me against getting sucked in. I have not given up on my interests or sacrificed my passions. I am not doing different things. I want to do things differently. <laughs>